Thank you for coming. Um, my name is Jennifer Anderson. I teach creative nonfiction, publishing arts, and composition here at LCSC. I'm also the advisor for Talking River Review, our school's um, student-run literary journal. And before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we at Lewis Clark State College gather here today on the indigenous homelands of the Nimipu, the Nez Perce tribe. We acknowledge the Nimipu as original caretakers since time immemorial and recognize their continuing connection to the land, to the water, and to their ancestors. We wish to take this opportunity to express our deepest appreciation and respect for the ongoing relationship built between Lewis Clark State College and the Nez Perce tribe. This is LC State's 42nd annual Stegner Lecture. This lecture, established in 1982 with Wallace Stegner as the inaugural speaker, has long been a literary and cultural highlight for the college and the larger Lewiston-Clarkston community, featuring discussions about the writer's relationship with the physical and psychological territories in which they reside. Past speakers have included Edward Abbey, Norman McLean, Linda Hogan, Terry Tempest Williams, Robert Wrigley, Kim Barnes, Natalie Diaz, C. Marie Furman, among so many others. Tonight, we are honored to feature Beth Alvarado. We've had a wonderful few days with her here at the college, where she visited three of our humanities classes and also led a session at the Center for Teaching and Learning. And I know I can speak for all of us when I say that her insights, her encouragement, and kindness have left us all inspired. I'd like to thank my colleagues in the Humanities Division for their generous help with and support of this event, specifically the Visiting Writer Committee, Marlo Daly Galeano, Lauren Connolly, and Louis Sylvester. I'd also like to thank Bryce Cammers, Leilani Farrell, uh, Kimberly Tolson, our Student Ambassador, Maddie Hutchison, our Interim Division, Division Chair, Julie Bezzarides, Liberal Arts and Sciences Dean, um, Martin Gibbs, and President President Pemberton. Thank you to Alexandria Scalise and Josie Hafer here at the Center for Arts and History for lending us this beautiful space for tonight's event. And if you haven't had a chance, please, after the reading, look at all of the lovely textiles. They're just simply amazing down here. <clears throat> And thanks, too, to Kevin Grout in Communications and Marketing, who's back there recording this lecture, which will be posted to the Humanity Division um, YouTube channel at a later date. This event was made possible by an LC State Institutional Development Grant, as well as the generous support of Rose Hill Funds. I'm now going to turn it over to Xander McDowell, a secondary education English major at LC State and our Associated Student Body President who I've had the pleasure of getting to know this semester in the Creative Nonfiction Workshop. He will introduce tonight's lecturer, and following the lecture, there will be time for questions. Also, after the lecture, two of our Talking River Review interns there at the back of the room are selling copies of our most recent issue, number 55, which opens with a beautiful essay by Beth Alvarado titled Cautionary Tales, an essay that's also featured in her book, which is also for sale back there, Anxious Attachments. Um, two of her other books, Anthropologies and Jillian in the Borderlands, are also for sale. And I'm sure she would be um, very glad to sign copies for you after the reading as well. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Xander. Thank you, Professor Anderson. All right. Welcome, and thank you all for coming out tonight for the 42nd Annual Stegner Lecture. I have the honor and privilege of introducing tonight's guest, Beth Alvarado. Beth Alvarado's work is primarily set in Tucson, Arizona, where she and her husband, Fernando, grew up and raised their children. She taught at the University of Arizona for many years and now holds a faculty position at Oregon State University Cascades Low Residency MFA program. She is now on the advisory board of Jack Lake Press and the editorial board of Puro Chicanx Writing of the 21st Century. In 2020, she was also presented with the Oregon Literary Career Fellowship Award. Her most recent book, Jillian in the Borderlands, A Cycle of Rather Dark Tales, was described by a reviewer as, quote, 
marrying the social justice novel with magical realism to render a disquieting portrait of the humanitarian toll of our immigration policies. Much of her work takes a focus on life in the U.S.-Mexico borderlands. Beth Alvarado writes about marrying into her late husband's Mexican-American family when she was just 19 years old. Her essay collection, Anxious Attachments, was long listed for the Penn Diamondstein Spielvogel Award for the Art of the Essay and won the 2020 Oregon Book Award for Creative Nonfiction. Her lyric memoir, Anthropologies, layers scenes, oral histories, portraits, family myths and dreams in a cross-cultural mosaic. Her first story collection, Not a Matter of Love, won the Many Voices Project Prize for work that the final judge called, quote, wise, witty, and unflinching. Her short stories, essays, and reviews have appeared in many fine journals, including The Sun, Plowshares, Fourth Genre, The Southern Review, River Teeth, Guernica, Lit Hub, and The Los Angeles Review. Three of her essays have been chosen as notable by Best American Essays, and her stories have been anthologies in The Female Complaint, Tales of Unruly Women, and New California Writing. During my own reading of Alvarado's work, specifically Notes on Silence, the first part of her memoir, Anthropologies, I became entranced by her fragmented poetic language. Each note details either the present day or core memories of Alvarado, although some may be incomplete or compiled together through retellings of stories from her family. Yet, each builds upon the idea of memory as essential to this internal world, a place where you can navigate through time and gain insight from your own past as well as from family members. A key passage that caught my attention was, quote, everything that heals also cuts, unquote, denoting how this travel through time, investigating the memories of oneself and our loved ones is a journey of self-discovery. While these memories and stories may provide healing for the parts of ourselves that have been damaged, they can also reopen wounds we have fought hard to bury in the past. At the core of these notes is the theme of familial silences, the events or people family choose to pretend are non-existent. Traumatic experiences and fractured relationships can mold us into who we are and who we choose to be. However, these troublesome stories can be passed down to future generations who are left to fill in these gaps. Alvarado writes, what haunts are not the dead, but the gaps left within us by the secrets of others. Silence may be the very thing we need in times of healing but it can also be the barrier that keeps us from it. Silence can heal and silence can cut. Alvarado dives into the rocky waters of working towards healing, pushing back against these silences by bringing them into light through family portraits, narratives, and an exploration of her own memories. It is revealed in these notes that Alvarado's mother had asked her to listen to her stories, write them down and retell them, perhaps for the sake of her memory living on. Maybe to change these familial silences to an authentic family history. And maybe, for the sake of all who read Alvarado's work, to identify our own silences. To work through ours and our family's past and discover how all of our stories are a single shared memory. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Beth Alvarado. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> so moving. Um, I feel like I understand my own book better. <laughs> you could start that. <laughs> I wasn't quite sure what I was doing. Um, but I have just had such a wonderful visit here. Can you hear me okay in the back? I've had such a wonderful visit here and I just want to thank everyone. I'm just, um, I was so nervous. I've been a wreck for like two weeks and um, then I got here and I, and I met everyone, I met the faculty and the students and I just felt so welcomed and everyone was really kind and I'm still nervous but um, I listened to the students read their work last night and it was so, um, it was so moving and so beautiful <laughs> and I thought well if they can be brave enough to read something that's in process then I feel brave enough to read this because it is a poem I mean it's not a poem it's an essay that's in process so it isn't something that's finished but before I start reading from the essay I want to thank um, Jennifer for I'm, I want to thank you Xander for <laughs> the introduction and I want to thank Jennifer um, for all the work you've done to make this visit um, so wonderful and Marlo and also Leilani for doing all of the arrangements. Um, I've had such a wonderful time and the Rose Hill Estate and the center is 
just is an amazing place to read. And also Talking River Review for publishing the, the essay that's from my book. So I just am just <laughs> full of gratitude to all of you for all of those things. Um, so I am going to read, this is from an essay in process. And um, anyway, I, I wrote this down because I knew I'd be nervous. So last April, I walked the Camino de Santiago in Spain with my son. We walked the last 110 kilometers, which was about 70 miles, from Saria to Santiago de Compostela. I knew that um, I would want to write about this trip for a book I've been working on, which is called Unreachable Cities. It's a book of essays. The thing is that so many people have written about the Camino. Everybody that goes on it wants to write a book. And so I was trying to figure out how I could make it something new. And I had, that was actually what I had wanted to send to Talking River, was an essay about the Camino. But I just couldn't get it written. And um, so I gave up <laughs> and gave something that was already published. But then um, one morning in October, about 3 a.m., I woke up and I just had this paragraph in my head. And I thought, OK, I'm going to go in and write this down without even turning the light on. And so I did. And um, I can't tell you how much I loved that little paragraph. It was just so beautiful. And it was the closest thing that I had ever written to a prose poem. Um, I loved the way it was full of images and jumped around from thought to thought. It felt absolutely true to the voice in my head. And by that, I mean the voice when you first wake up and things are just kind of jumping around and don't make sense. And, and it's OK, because you're still kind of in that dream state. So later, when I typed up this paragraph, it was exactly six lines. And I thought, OK, because I love this little paragraph so much, that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to try to write a bunch of little six-line paragraphs and find out what happens. And um, after a while, it was clear that, the, that those paragraphs were going to become an essay, which makes sense because the essay, as we were talking about in class, is from the French, which means to try or to test. It's an experiment. And so, and I think of the essay as enacting its subject matter. The essay should be doing what it's about. Um, so a lot of writers talk about the essay as the mind on the page. And in fact, Edward Hoagland wrote that the personal essay is like the human voice talking. It's order the mind's natural flow. And that's what I really wanted to capture in this essay was the kind of flow, the rhythm of walking on the Camino for days, <laughs> being tired, carrying the pack, and how, um, and, and could I capture that, you know, that rhythm of walking? Another thing that influenced the writing um, is stand-up comedy. <laughs> I'd been watching a lot of stand-up comedy at night and the evenings, and it occurred to me that the form is like an essay, that it lends itself to um, cycling through uncensored thoughts. So this is, that's what I tried to do as I was writing this. So I'm just telling you that. <laughs> um, you can listen for the overall narrative, or you can pretend like you're listening to a series of prose poems. Um, and I also just want to tell you that nothing bad is going to happen in this essay. This is the opposite of a trigger warning. Nothing bad is going to happen. Um, no dogs or children will be harmed. Um, but there are, it is about some serious things. So OK, with that, now I'm going to begin the essay. Let me see how much time I've taken. OK, we're OK. So the first paragraph is that one that I woke up in the middle of the night. My bones wake me up at night. My doctor won't listen. Is it my pain, or am I a tuning fork for the world? It's my hips at first, then those long bones above my knees, the ones that help me walk. They are screaming. The aspens did not do their golden shimmering this fall. They went straight to white branches. This morning, the pain began in my right thumb, that one knuckle a burning knot. It woke me up, and I thought of my friend who, when they picked her up off the bed, started crying and then turned to dust. My friend was a dancer. She rode her horse into Mexico to film the Tarahumara. Legend has it that they run all day through the desert without adequate shoes. Of course, they still feel pain. After my son and I finished walking the Camino, I thought, 
good. I don't have to do that again. It was on Michael's bucket list, not mine. I wondered if my bones hurt from all the walking, yet I still walk. Sometimes I long to walk all day through hills of green and trees of green. I long to listen to my son cycle through his thoughts. One day, hopefully after you die, he would said, as we were leaving the States, maybe long after, I'm going to hike into the wilderness, take a lot of shrooms, and die. Michael was afraid his arthritis would get so bad that he would not be able to walk. One reason for the trip now, while we could both walk easily. I'm not going to die on this trip, I told him, alarmed because one of my daughter's twins was afraid I would. No, he said, you're not going to die on this trip. Your children will never not need you, I said. I sounded like my mother, stern. On the Camino, we followed paths into tunnels of trees. Others passed us as my son accommodated his long stride to mine, or walked ahead, then waited. There were low stone walls. Sometimes the earth was red, or there was slate, slick with rain. Michael said, I was strolling the Camino. We passed through huddles of homes made of stone. When there was no roof, a small forest inside. In the mornings, we walked together. Buen Camino. Think of time as the shape of hills, the sound of footsteps and breathing. After my husband died, he communicated through electronics. In the kitchens in the mornings, I'd sigh into his absence. Oh, Ferdy. And the microwave would answer, two, two, two. <laughs> Always two, two, two. After the stress test yesterday, I turned on the car radio, something I never do, and the song, I Will Wait For You, came on, Mumford and Sons, numero uno on the soundtrack of my grief. I knew it was a message. Ah, oh, Ferdy, I said. But I don't know if he meant, hurry up, I've been waiting a long time. <laughs> or, no rush, I'll wait. I knew time was different in eternity, but I'd still ask him to wait for me. He was dying, actively dying, when I asked him to wait. Ten years ago, he died. I said, you may have to wait for a long time, but it won't seem long to you. The phrase actively dying is shocking because it is so accurate. Organs shutting down, the point of no return. I hope when I die, I will be like him and say I'm not afraid, even if I am, to comfort our children. Like him, I'll raise my arms above my head and say, I tried, and then I'll stop breathing. The stress test was not stressful. I didn't have to run on the treadmill like last time when they kept saying, can you go any faster? Or just a few minutes more. They did shoot me up with isotopes. I was radioactive again, so no running, but fire in my veins, and then something speedy which hurt my neck and dizzied my brain. I lost my words. Was it my carotid arteries? Then, lying still on the table so the machine could map the vessels as they lit up, I imagined my body was like the earth seen from outer space at night. If my doctor were interested in listening, he might ask what worries me. Cognitive decline, I would tell him, and constipation. <laughs> this morning, I found myself sitting on the toilet topless, peeing and putting my bra on at the same time. <laughs> what was the rush? Why do two things at once? Perhaps other people always multitask, but I attributed this lapse to age and sleep deprivation. Yesterday, one of the twins said, that poop was a feisty one. <laughs> I could still feel it. So even the very young worry about constipation. By cognitive decline, I don't mean drawing the numbers on a clock or arranging the hands to indicate 245. 
This is what they want you to do post 65, to prove you're still with it. My doctor repeats everything exactly three times, loudly, as if I not only don't understand him, but am deaf. By cognitive decline, I would tell him, I mean memory, and not the what day is it who is the president kind of memory. I mean focusing on writing my book, maintaining my interest in what will happen next paying attention to nuance. What will happen next? Existential worry I don't think Medicare covers. At least with Russia and Ukraine, I tell my friend, it is clear. But now, with Hamas and Netanyahu, all I know is my heart hurts. My friend's glad that we are finally forced to see clearly on the world stage that the binaries are false. It's all about the manufacture of consent, she says, what this war reveals about the value of women and children. True, I say, but haven't we always been dismissed as collateral damage? Take a breath, I told myself the other day. It was raining. I was walking up a long hill, probably worrying about something. School shootings, the twins playing army, this is when you should take deep breaths, Michael had said on the Camino, on steep hills. It was true. Why the shallow breaths then? But I did the same thing when I was in labor. I'd forget to breathe. Fernando kept hitting me on the back. Breathe. Deep breath, the massage therapist tells me. I even hold my breath during sex, waiting for the orgasm. Is this following okay? Even though it's a bunch of little disjointed things? Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure. I was like, I'm going to quit now. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Do I have to be like my mother in all things? When I went in for cataract surgery, I was most afraid of becoming her. An irrational thought. Her eyes were brown. Mine are blue. Although hers turned blue when she died. When I tried to shut them, I noticed blue. In the surgery center, there was a long hallway with curtained off beds. The nurse made a small X with a sharpie above my left eye. The doctor looked into my eyes as if he loved me. Cataract surgery, I remember thinking, must be his bread and butter. Before the second surgery, I wondered, what if he tried to fix the left eye twice? I was sure in the history of the world it had happened. A nurse in the hallway was saying the grid was down, too cold. This did not bode well. Then something about arrhythmias, but whose? I was wrapped like a burrito, arms at my sides. Elizabeth, another woman behind the curtain was saying, Elizabeth? But did she mean me? The doctor drew the X above my right eye himself. You will remember more this time, he said. You wouldn't want coal for Christmas, the, tw the other twin says, apropos of nothing, unless you didn't have a home, because then you could burn it to stay warm. Many people on this earth have to burn fuel in their small unventilated homes. I don't tell him this. Their children develop asthma. I myself have started to use a CPAP machine at night, which requires distilled water and electricity and a bed and a room. Plus, I have to wear this mask like Darth Vader. If it isn't your bones, it's your heart. Do you masturbate first and then put on your mask? Or do you put on your mask first, settle into the warm bed, and then decide to masturbate? These are two questions I didn't ask my sister, who has, to use, who has had to use a CPAP machine for a long time. Anyway, she's married. So I assume no mask with sex. We have our father to thank for this, I tell her. I mean the severe sleep apnea, not the desire for an orgasm. I have no idea if he masturbated. He did die of heart failure. Cognitive decline in his case was questionable. The veil has been stripped away, my friend says, what we need is nuanced thinking. But who is capable of nuance? She is. 
Maybe I am, although I can see the attraction of being certain. On the other hand, moral certitude causes gaps in our vision. Other people simply are not. Picture the little girl running away from napalm. Orientals don't value life the way we do, General Westmoreland said. Even my father, a kind man, he could think clearly about geologic formations. But was my mother ever more than the shape of his desire? I am the shape of an old woman to my doctor, and one who has had a good run of it at that. But when, in the first hostage release, there are several women in their 70s, I think, why them? Were they too demanding? Or are they worth less in trade? Are there such equations? If x equals bombs dropped, and y equals ground gained, then what is z? Lives lost? I want to see the book of the algebra of war. I want the doctor to see me instead of the shape of me. I'm writing about Spain, I tell him. I am productive, therefore I am. OK, now we're finally getting to Spain. <laughs> Passport check, Madrid. The, bo the border guard was almost handsome. He asked Michael if he was Mexican. Fernando Miguel, the name on the passport. Or maybe it was because of the way he spoke Spanish. Michael is tall like his father, black hair, more gray in his beard than on his head, but fair skin like his tata. Half Mexican, he responded. Then he pointed to me. The other half is standing right there. The guard laughed. <laughs> They said a few sentences to one another, which I have either forgotten or never understood. We were walking, I think, for the sake of walking. Have you set your intentions? So many asked. I drew a blank. Such a thing seems antithetical to my personality. I got married thinking, oh well, if it doesn't work out, we can just get divorced. As I was wheeled into delivery with Catherine, I said, I'm not sure I want to do this again. A little late for that, Fernando said. When I knew he was dying, I tried to make it easy for him. Was that an intention? But then I was surprised when he stayed dead. When he was alive, we went to Madrid. This was in 2000. Before we left, his father said, if you see the king of Spain, tell him we want our gold back. We saw the palace, but not the king. We saw the place where, when the king and queen had just married, someone threw a bomb out of an upstairs window down on their carriage. The horses were killed. We saw flamenco in Plaza Mayor. We saw the Guernica and all the Goyas. A ghost in our room, Fernando was sure, a ghost following us. If I touched the sun-warm stones with my hand, would I feel terror? This is where they used to kill people, I told Michael. Plaza Mayor. We were looking for tapas. Here, they burned heretics alive if they would not confess. If they did confess, they slit their throats and called it mercy. An auto de fe grew big crowds, like a lynching in the States. Michael was standing under an arch. Outside, crowded streets, blue sky. The back of his t-shirt said, don't be a dick. Have you seen, I know I always think that's so funny. <laughs> uh, he's like that, that kid. Um, <laughs> have you seen the way? That was another question. Michael wanted to walk. I wanted to see the Guernica again. The anguish of that horse, the woman holding her dead child, the bare light bulb of a son. Michael noticed the horse's butthole which is why you take your kids to museums, to, sh <laughs> to show you what you do not see. And El Bosco, as the Spanish call Hieronymus Bosch, how we love the garden of earthly delights, the angel visiting whomever, birds as big as naked humans, divine insects, fish swallowing men. Each time I saw a shrine marking where someone dropped dead, I took a picture. If the doctor had listened before I left for the Camino, he might have upped my thyroid medication. Even I didn't suspect sleep apnea, not until Michael, after sharing the first hotel room, said, Mom, I think you stop breathing at night. 
For months I'd wondered, long COVID? What was this brain fog? Now I know, low thyroid, lack of sleep, lack of oxygen during sleep. Add to that the walking, the backpack, no wonder then. Los tres, Michael calls them, the three amigos, two men supporting a third between them, helping him walk, half dragging him all the way. Sons and a father, three brothers, friends, Michael says. The professor from LA wears a red hat and red lipstick. Her cell phone and extension of her arm appears magically to capture every vista. I admire her flair. Like Michael, she draws everyone to her. Her husband, his feet so badly blistered, he is the only one slower than me. The professor and I come to the bridge with three arches. She decides to wait for her husband. I decide to cross. Looking for Michael, I get lost. My Spanish fails me. Then he and I are sitting in a cafe. That's how memory works. We watch the cook arrive with his knives. The professor and her husband are sitting in the garden. The scallops, did we have them? Yes. Michael talks about walking with his son in four years. The husband works with teenagers, says they blossom when allowed to be true to themselves. We flew out of Boise on the day Idaho passed laws against my granddaughter's body. Michael and his wife could be prosecuted for helping her get medical care. It's a crime against humanity, my friend says, to deny someone care because of their gender. Madrid, the Reina Sofia. We take a picture of the banner celebrating queer futures, possible only because of the death of Franco in the year of Michael's birth. Even after Franco died, decades of silence and buried bodies. El pacto del olvido, although who can forget? Hard to write with two wars in the world, I say to my student. Try six or seven, he corrects me, a vet. So, who am I to speak? What can I add? That old anxiety. My friend says, expose the cognitive dissonance. Does the genre demand conclusions, she asks? Then lean away from the genre. Distill things into nuggets of rage or insight. But this is hard to do when your REM sleep is constantly interrupted, your dreams taken away. And why suddenly are the twins fascinated with guns and tanks and soldiers? Walking with your mother, a man from another country asks, what's that like? We grew up together, Michael says. True, I was a mere child when I had him. By the time I was 32, he was 12 and taller than me. The music of his teenaged years makes me more nostalgic than that of my own. Every now and then, on a train or a bus, he takes my hand in his and I tear up, although I don't want him to see. His hand, so big now. It used to be small, all the ways I've failed him. Why think of that? Why touch the most tender part? Cribbage in the afternoons while he has a beer and I drink wine. His hand moves the peg so quickly. I've never known how to keep score. I tend to forgive and expect to be forgiven. On the plane, he'd asked, do we need to repair anything? No, I said, I don't think so. I'd read attention was a form of devotion. That's what I wanted to give him. I wanted him to trust me, to tell me what he needed. I once lamented to Catherine, I've been a better mother to you than to Michael. Oh, mom, she said, you've scarred me too. <laughs> Do I think about this as I walk alone? about how his health troubles have made him distant? No, I think about breathing, the sound of my footsteps, about making it up the hill, around the next corner. If only my pack were lighter. No more wine, I tell myself. But no vino, no camino, as one graffitied wall says. 
Michael asks if the walking is too easy, if we need to suffer more. Did not taking his meds before we came mean he was punishing himself? Suffering does not make you a good person, I say. We all suffer. It's how we bear it that matters. Green was the silence, wet was the light. That's Lorca. <laughs> there is a house where flowers bloom in shoes left behind by other pilgrims. Paths worn deep through the centuries, two feet, three feet deeper than the surrounding land. Ferns growing through stone wall stones in the walls. Wet slate, slick cobbles, slipping from boulder to boulder to ford a stream. How do the three amigos navigate? The Israeli family with their toddlers and wagon. We hear school children singing as they come up from behind and pass us. An orange roar comes over the tree line. A dragon? No, an airliner. Some pilgrims fly, evidently. Who built the stone walls, the bridges? Who laid the cobbles? In the Codex Calixtinus, a 12th century travel guide, we are told their names, told of rivers from which we must not drink. The water runs unhealthy there for horses and men. Thieves wait with knives. If you happen to eat eels, you will for sure die. In a wooded area called Laba Cola, the French people wash not only their private parts, but the dirtiness off all their bodies. In the Codex, the French monk's prejudices require a whole chapter. <laughs> The Gascons are quick with words, talkative, chortlers, libidinous, drunkards, lavish with food, of unkempt clothing and accessories. Accessories? Others ride the pilgrims like asses, remind you of dogs barking, or eat and drink, eat, drink and dress like pigs. All are barbarous, especially the Goths and Saracens who show their private parts to each other. That's in quotes too. Even the Galicians, whom he praises as being more Gallic, are evil-tempered and very litigious. Sometimes in a cathedral, in that still cool air, I feel the faith of others. Do I feel it while I'm walking? These paths worn deep in the earth by the feet of people who believe. But what do they believe? Now traffic, now a city, people streaming towards us. This is disorienting. We stop for coffee with the pilgrim from Germany. She says people built cathedrals to be forgiven their sins. Indulgences, they called it. In the Americas, I say, it's difficult to talk about Christianity without also thinking about colonialism. My cousin, the Orthodox nun, told me that martyrs of old filled their arms with wood and ran to the fire where they would be burned alive. The sea still boils red where St. Marcella's father, possessed by a demon, cut off her breasts and head. In the Codex, chapter 8, on the bodies of the saints, we are told of martyrs and miracles and the persecution of Jews. The Holy Spirit, evidently, descends in tongues of fire and fills heart with zeal for killing. In Quranic Arabic, I'm told, martyr also means witness as into witness falling buildings. Into the old walled city, then through the short tunnel where a man is playing the bagpipes, an instrument Fernando loved. Isn't there a video on my phone of Michael putting money in his case? Okay, here's the picture of us in front of the cathedral. I remember the next day, the bagpipes again. We see the three amigos, they have just arrived. The tall one begins speaking and gesticulating wildly. Michael is hugging them. They are hugging me, all the men crying. The cathedral is golden inside. We stand with so many others. A golden statue rides a golden horse above us and brandishes a sword of gold. Mexico, all I can think about, where the gold came from, who labored, Jesus could overturn a few tables here, I imagine Fernando saying. Then the bota fumiero we've all been waiting for, 
Three men swing it over the pilgrims, higher and higher until the golden vessel filled with live coals and burning incense is horizontal above their heads. I expect a shower of fire. I didn't think they would make it, Michael said of the three amigos, at a table now outside the professor and her husband. How do I describe the cafe, the narrow streets, graffiti like art or art like graffiti? Rasho, cubes of, cubes of pork, crisped fat but tender, fries from real potatoes. The professor tells the waiter he has an unusual face. Fail, he asks, but he is pleased this is how she draws people to her. She notices them. Michael, she tells me, is so open with his emotions. Yes, I think, like you, he has a generosity of spirit. Maybe he'd floated the suicide idea out there, like when, as a teenager, he'd said, I'm thinking about dropping acid. The key, I thought, was not to overreact. So I took the information in. Let it sink like a stone. Your children will never not need you, I'd said. You should know this, I didn't say, because even though your father died 10 years ago, don't you still need him? Of course, always putting your children first can feel claustrophobic, but it can get you through when nothing else will. Everyone on the Camino remembers Michael. Oh, he says, I guess people do like me. I'm surprised that was ever a question. Even as I planned our walk, I knew I'd want to write about it, but my children don't like me writing about their lives. <laughs> they feel misrepresented, maybe, betrayed, maybe. But when I am required to be silent about some things, I feel silenced about all things. If I can't put my thoughts into words on a page, I can't follow their trail. And if I can't follow their trail, what's the point? Do you want to go, I'd ask him, along the coast of death to the end of the earth? Of course he did. We took a bus. Although he could have walked, he missed walking, he said. Santiago came too soon. The walk to Fistera would have been beautiful, I agreed but we would have missed Musia. Is this where he takes my hand and where I feel that child, that irrepressible child? And who is that old woman? My mother-in-law said she always wondered this when she saw her reflection in the mirror. The way to the end of the earth is all uphill. We walk along a narrow road up, cliffs of, up above cliffs of green, Far below the sea, it is sunny. Michael walking at a clip cannot rein himself in. On triangular warning signs, a picture of a body plunging off the side. Someone has written, Volar. I stop to breathe. There is too much I don't know, can't know, how war will un upend everything, how it will feel as if we are entering the darkest of times. How, when the twins ask me about death, I won't know how to answer. People have left their backpacks like offerings, but I don't see Michael's. There are bagpipes. The wind is terrific. Imagine believing this is the end of the earth. This blue sky, this blue sea, to fly above, to sail upon, to plunge into cold, cold water. There are riptides. Has Michael been carried away? This occurs to me. Those are the boulders I must climb up and then climb down if I'm to follow him. But I can't. When he emerges, we go to a picnic table in a grassy place, and he writes in his notebook for a long time. No mistake, it is a beautiful thing, the Camino, Ann Carson writes. It stretches away from you. That giddy lunch in Santiago when Michael and I talked about writing a screenplay. I'd read the Codex and was obsessed with the dragons. He talked about three friends, their journey. 
A second beer and we could see it, a buddy film with time travel. But by dinner, he says, I think we are writing two different books. Not until Boise in the airport do I realize we will never have this time together again. Whole families under rubble. Their shadows fall over me even as I describe the green fields of Spain, the bright bags of potato chips in the shops, the mounds of oranges. The shadows fall over us as we walk the kids through snow to the bus stop. There is no way to weigh grief, to compare sorrows. My friend who died of bone cancer did not turn to dust, although that's how her husband described the shattering. It is not only your children who will always need you, I want to tell Michael, but your sister. Have you thought of your sister, her children? It is not easy to abandon this world. That's the end of it. So. <laughs> okay, so thank you for listening. I know it might have been kind of a, a long thing to listen to. Um, it's actually only, uh, it's less than half of the essay. So I extracted kind of one thread so that it would feel like it had its own arc. So it's really, it begins where the longer, it, it begins where the longer essay begins and ends where it ends. But I, you know, like it, I edited out in the middle so that it wouldn't be too long to read. Um, so I want to open for questions and I hope you do ask questions. And I, you should feel free to ask me anything. If I don't want to answer it, I'll tell you I don't want to answer it. Um, or I can't answer it. That happens sometimes, too. Um, but first, because this is a work in progress, I just thought I would mention a few of the things that I struggled with while I was writing it. And I really did keep, you know, like I'll show you, well, I'll show you a page that I haven't scribbled all over. Um, oh, that's, well, okay, I kind of scribbled on that one. Um, but you see, like, the paragraphs look like they're all the same length. So that was my constraint. The paragraphs had to be these very compressed little paragraphs. And so they turn out to be almost more like um, prose poems, I think. And also, you know, I'm happy with that. I like to do something, uh, you know, I like to try new things. So I, you know, so that was one of the challenges is, you know, if I follow this constraint, I mean, you can always break your own rules because they are your rules. But if I follow this constraint, will the essay have a, you know, like a narrative thread? You know, how long can I sustain the momentum of the essay if it's in these little chunks? So that was one of the things I struggled with. And the other thing is, you know, if the essay is the mind on the page, if that's actually what you're trying to capture is the mind on the page, how do you not write about the news or other things that are going on in your life? I mean, because they come into your mind while you're writing. So do you just ignore them and then you have these erasures in your essay? Do you just say, oh, that's outside my focus? Or, I mean, if you're, what you're really trying to get, you know, like, how do you deal with that? So do you just not mention those things? Do you mention them? And, and then how do you mention them? Like, how can you do it without feeling like you're um, traumatizing people or bludgeoning them with your point of view? You know, so those were my two, I mean, there are lots of challenges, but those are my two main challenges. And, um, and I, I bring up the set, both of them because I think they're things that a lot of writers struggle with. Like, how do I maintain momentum? How do I address difficult subject matter, especially if it's not stuff that I personally have experienced? So I just wanted to put those on the table, but you can ask me, you can ask me what kind of shoes I wore. I, I wore um, ultras. <laughs> Um, so with the story, I, it's like, but she comes from a Mexican family, right? And does that have to do with anything about your own life as well? Oh, the story you read, Lost in the Thorny Desert? Oh, um, okay, so my, yeah, well, it doesn't... <laughs> So the character um, of Jillian is very loosely based on my daughter. And so, of course, my daughter's very outspoken, so I made Jillian not be able to speak. <laughs> it was, <laughs> no, that's not really why I made Jillian mute. Um, but <laughs> but um, it is, you know, in that, I, 
I lived in that area. I lived in, the, in Tucson for most of my life. My husband was Mexican-American. So I felt like, um, you know, like I knew the issues and everything. I knew that area. My daughter did have twins, and, um, but um, her twins did not, were not born speaking both Spanish and English. Like the twins in the book are born um, speaking, you know, so it was very loosely based on my life. What I did realize um, the other day, and I really only realized it the other day, is that Jillian is also kind of like me in that it's hard for me to talk about my emotions, and I made this character, my main character could not speak, and she was female. And I thought, what kind of feminist am I, right, to create this adolescent girl that can't speak? So I had to give her a gift, and that one of her gifts is that she can draw, and eventually, um, her drawings begin to create reality. And so I gave her a gift. Also, she can hear people's thoughts. Um, you know, I mean, I gave her a few, you know, really great gifts because I deprived her of speech. Oh, um, so I noticed there's a lot more Spanish. I was wondering how much Spanish you speak and how better writing it. I am not that fluent. <laughs> no, I'm, you know, like, I am. Um, you know, like my son says, my son is more fluent than I am because he worked in the kitchens in L.A. for a long time. But I can, um, you know, I can ask somebody to pass the milk, you know, and um, I can hear phrases that are said over and over, but I'm not fluent enough to, sp but I like to leave it without translation. I like to, you know, hope, because when I listen, when I hear Spanish, I get a lot of the meaning from context, and that's how, if you're a Spanish speaker, you understand English. So I try to not translate, but give enough clues that the, another reader can understand. Yeah. Any question? any other questions? Yes. Uh, I read uh, this book, Anka's Attachments. Oh, uh, yes. And you had an interesting way of weaving politics in, into your story about when the twins were being born. Mm -hmm. And on the television, Trump was elected the first time. Yeah, it was kind of a and weird then night. You, you expressed the, the right to lifers were voting against welfare or against mm -hmm. things that would protect children's lives. Yes. And then you went on later and talked about that. Yeah, those are all things that are but really that, important to me. That sort of demonstrates how you take your life and you put it in context with what's going on in the rest of the world. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, I think that's good. I'm sorry? I think that's a good thing. I, I don't hear it. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, I do try to do that. I mean, it's important. I think it's important to be a whole person in your writing. Yeah. How did that impact your writing? Because that is one of the most pivotal, pivotal things you have in your life. Um, well, so, okay, so I, when I was working on anxious, anxious Attachments, which are the essays, I was wor working on Jillian in the Borderlands, which is the fiction, you know, our short stories at the same time. And um, so I could not write about his death immediately. Um, but after about a year, I wrote a short story in Jillian in the Borderlands where the, you know, the <laughs> Jillian's mother didn't have a husband in that book until my husband died. And then I was like, okay, well, I'm, you know, I'm going to have Jillian's long lost father show up and then I'm going to kill him off. You know, I mean, that's what I did in the fiction. But I think it was because I needed to get some kind of emotional distance in order to write about it. So I was writing about the, I made the husband not as likable as my husband for one thing. And then um, I wrote about it from the point of view of Jillian and her mother and other people's point of view. Although my husband really did, um, I mean, he died of liver cancer, but that was exacerbated by um, TCE in the water, by water pollution in Tucson. And so I had that happen in the fiction too, because I wanted to get at the environmental pollution in both books. And um, so after I wrote about it in um, the fictional version of it, then a couple of years after that, I was able to write about it more directly. But I think you do need to kind of um, 
distance yourself. And, and you know, that's one of the gifts of constraints because I could not write about Spain because my son had said that to me on the way there. And I just, you know, like I was like obsessed with it the whole trip. And so I kept trying to write about it in a direct way and it was just too hard. But when I came up with those little six line paragraphs, it gave me a way of getting at that emotional material. And I think that's what Jillian in the Borderlands did too. So really those, I mean, like your question, like is that based on my life? It's absolutely based on my life, but I fictionalized it in order to get some distance and to be able to get that emotional reality in there. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it seems that you insert a lot of your own life and your own like thoughts into your writing. Is there anything that you absolutely wouldn't write about from yourself? Anything about yourself you would never write about or put down for other people to read? Well, I might, I mean, I, this has not happened so far, so maybe I'm an exhibitionist, I don't know, but um, I don't keep a journal, you know, um, but I, I could do something like that. I could, I could write something and then not publish it. But there are absolutely, but so far I, I don't, I don't feel like there's anything that, uh, I mean, there's stuff I wouldn't write about, like I wouldn't write about I mean, I did say masturbation in here, but I wouldn't write about, you know, actual sex with somebody. <laughs> I know it would just be too embarrassing. Um, I mean, and everybody has it, you know. <laughs> but, um, but there are things that I, I mean, I write about other people, but I wouldn't write about their secrets. Like, I wouldn't write about anyone's worst secrets in, um, in my work. And in fact, I gave this essay to my son to read because I thought, well, you know, it's going to be videotaped, and then people can watch it, and he has an 18-year-old, and he has a 14-year-old, and, you know, I just thought, oh, well, maybe he won't want me to read this, and I'll have to f read something else, and um, he was fine with it, and it actually opened up a really good conversation by, about what he meant um, when he said that, and why he said it, and his whole philosophy about um, you know, when the time comes, he would choose to die rather than live life in a way that he doesn't want to live it, which makes me really sad, you know, but I at least understand him better than I did before I wrote the essay and before I gave it to him. So. Yeah. I noticed you talked about how it's helped you to express yourself verbally, but on pain it's a lot easier for you. Mm -hmm. I wonder how you work with the balance of expressing yourself, your opinions, your feelings, but also connecting to your audience and also kind of dealing with those controversial ideas that might possibly upset your audience. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I was hoping, I, when I read this, I knew there were some things in here that could really upset people, and that might have been why I was so anxious for the two weeks before reading it. But then I thought, you know, I don't want to censor myself. I just try to be as fair as I can and, and hope that people realize that, um, I mean, like, like I'm just bringing, so that was one of the challenges of writing the piece. And so for me, I've, <laughs> I have this friend that I talk to about my writing, and she's the one who would, I, I let her say all the difficult things, right? My friend says, <laughs> it's about the manufacture of consent, you know? And I'm so it's like, not me, I didn't say that, Barbara said that, <laughs> you know? So for one thing is I, you know, like put it in, and then I'm not saying what I think we should do, or that one side is worse than the other, I mean, it's just a horrible, horrible thing. And I don't think we have enough distance from it um, in terms of time to be able to make up, to know, I mean, I don't know. So it's just, that's what I think of. It's like, so it's, I think the elliptical, you know, that the paragraphs are so short that it didn't require me to go into any kind of depth where I would have to take a stand, <laughs> you know. And um, because actually, I have, um, I've, I'm really worried about it. And I can't come to an easy conclusion. But we're not talking, no, but nobody talks about it, you know? 
It's just very, very difficult. Yeah. I just had a question about your constraints. Um, are there any places in the essay where you do break from it? Did you need any long paragraphs? Okay. So, you know, I was so strict at first. I mean, the thing that was good about it was it made me cut out extra fat. You know, there's very, they're very succinct. So, um, but yeah, so I was, at first I was very strict. It had to be exactly a little square, like six lines. And then every now and then it would go over by a couple of words. And I was like, well, I just can't lose any more from this paragraph. I've whittled it down as much as I can. And I can't compromise the meaning by going over a couple of words. And so then a couple of them, you know, I cut myself some slack. A couple of them were short, a couple of words too. But there's no seven, well, the last paragraph is seven lines. Let's see the last paragraph is seven lines. I'll confess. <laughs> but. I was kind of going off Arlo's question, um, just how you wove everything and threaded it together um, in these vignettes that read, just very clear and, oh, and good. repetition. And, and it was like this, this walk in that we were feeding. And, I'm wondering um, how much did you have to cut and paste to with the structure of, of what you what you wrote? Um, did you did it come out like this is first, this is second, or did you did you do a lot of weaving afterward? Well, every I mean mainly it, it mainly it comes out in the. Well, except for that it, I mean, I excised things that went off kind of on tangents. So just think about that as like going up a very long hill and coming down a very long hill, right? So I excised some of that. I mean, I moved some, took some of the paragraphs out, but pretty much they're in the order that they're in. And I knew that I was going to use, um, which is why I, if I, I could have not used this narrative thread about Michael. I could have used a different narrative thread, and then maybe I would not even have had to send him the essay. <laughs> but because I chose that as the narrative thread, it seemed really important. So there was a little bit of rearranging, and then I was also really conscious of the fact that if you repeat a keyword towards the end of one thing and then have it at the beginning of the next thing, the reader's mind is going to create the narrative. You don't have to be really explicit. I mean, this is something that is like a good thing to know when you're a writer, that you know you can really trust your reader to fill in those gaps as long as you just give them a little bit of help. Repetition is your friend. Yeah. Um, so based on what you've said and what I've seen of your work, it feels like your style is very sectional, like you like to write essays and put them together or short stories. Is there, is that something you kind of created yourself or did you have inspiration for that kind of style? I think a lot of people use that style now. You know, anthropologies, it was kind of unusual, the memoir. Um, and. And I had a hard time finding other writers that had done that, you know, like a memoir in vignettes like that. Um, there were a few, uh, Peggy Shoemaker, um, Just Breathe Normally, but most of them were people that had, you know, like Peggy Shoemaker had this really bad accident where she had a head injury and she couldn't remember. So there was a reason for her having those gaps. And I actually met her right after I finished Anthropologies and I said, oh, Peggy, I loved your book so much. I've never read a book like that. I said, I've just written one and I wish I'd read yours before. And she said, oh, well, what was your occasion? And I thought, oh, I had to have an occasion. <laughs> you know, like I didn't have a major injury or anything bad happened. And I was a little bit nervous about that, <laughs> that I didn't have an occasion. But I do like writing things. You know, part of it is time constraint. I mean, I still teach. I help take care of my daughter's twins. Um, I don't, I never have had the luxury of time, really. So, but maybe my mind just jumps around too, you know. But Jillian had the, Jillian and the Borderlands, there were a lot of constraints with that one. You know, it had to be in these different points of view and it had to be, um, had to have something magical happen in each story. And that was, and I actually think it's fun to write with constraints. Okay, there, anything else? 
Well, thank you very much. This has been wonderful.